Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle. My, I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Reed should be joining us here momentarily, and the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.lessoffrederick.com. We are rejoined by special guest over in the UK, Mr. Mark Bullock. How are you doing on this beautiful Thursday evening, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm not doing too bad. How are you guys? It's great, man. Tonight is the schedule release, and so we got to stay ahead of schedule. Uh, it's supposed to be at 8 o'clock tonight, Mark, and one of the leaks from today is that the Commanders are supposedly going to be playing against the Jets on Christmas Eve. What are your thoughts on that matchup? Because I think that's juicy. Yeah, I think that one's uh, an interesting one. Um, it's nice that they're not playing on Christmas Day. I think they've started doing that recently, haven't they, where, yeah. where they're playing games on Christmas Day. So it's nice to not have to be uh, paying attention to to that on Christmas Day. But um, yeah, on, on Christmas Eve, it's not too bad. Um, and yeah, the, I think the Jets, obviously, with now they've got Aaron Rodgers, they've got a pretty pretty legit roster there. So um, it will be a tough matchup. Um, and towards the end of the season, it, it could be a pretty important one in the, in the playoff run. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and uh, sticking with the uh, schedule leaks, kind of a two-part question also. So Twitter was also earlier this week, kind of in a craze because Matt Miller came out and made the comparison of Colt McCoy or Sam Howell to Colt McCoy as, uh, as a player saying they didn't have elite arm strength. They didn't think he had elite arm strength and whatnot. Great arm strength. Yeah, sorry. He didn't think he had great arm strength. And it was just leaked that week one, the commanders are going to be hosting the Arizona Cardinals, most likely led by Colt McCoy at FedEx field. So, um, how do you feel about the comparison to Colt McCoy as far as Sam Howell goes? And what are you expecting in the matchup with this defense against Colt McCoy? Yeah, but uh, the Colt McCoy comparison didn't really make that much sense to me. Yeah, they're, they're, they're both kind of undersized, but um, McCoy was always a little bit of a thinner, skinnier guy. Um, Sam Howell was kind of a thicker guy and, and has a little bit more weight to throw around. So he, he's not quite so... Um, his frame is probably more durable than what you what than what Colt McCoy has been, and and, and McCoy's always struggled with injuries throughout his career, and, and and I don't think Sam Howell will have the same issues. Um, and, and the arm strength thing was a was a weird comment to me because <laughs> Sam Howell doesn't have a weak arm at all. Like it, it, he can he can make all the throws. Um, and, and if if anything, he he needs to learn to to take something off of them sometimes. Um, and, and throw with a little bit more touch. So. I don't think the arm strength thing was a was a fair comparison to me. I, I I saw a lot of names being thrown around, but with in comparison to Sam Howell with that discussion, and I didn't really feel like many of them were particularly the most accurate. But um, yeah, I, I think if if it's the Cardinals' week one, I, I think that's a very good opportunity to get off to a strong start. Um, the Cardinals are uh, there's a reason that everyone thinks they're going to be picking first overall again next year. Um, and, and without Kyler Murray, that that's uh, well, he's he's still injured. There's a good chance he doesn't play. Um, then then it's going to be, um, yeah, Colt McCoy and and a bunch of kind of guys that are marginal NFL players at this point. So um, I I think Washington should expect themselves to do well there, um, and, and they should be thinking if, if that is the the first game of the season, they should, they should be coming away uh, with a win. Yeah, and like that comparison didn't make much sense to I me. Mean, I know the rationale was, well, you know, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, they have elite arm strength, and that's what I just don't think that. Well, if that's great arm strength to you, like, isn't Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes like incredible, like elite? Yeah. Like, now I don't think that he has uh, Sam Howell has elite arm strength, but I think the one thing you could say about Sam is he has great arm strength. But we have wasted too much time talking about that already. Um, I want to talk about the draft class, the rookies here, and I want to go into detail with Chris Rodriguez, the sixth round pick, the running back. How do you think that he fits into this offense, and do you think that you'll that he'll see a lot of playing time this year? Uh, I, I, it's hard to say he'll see a lot of playing time. I think it will be more dependent on how. Robinson, Brian Robinson, and Antonio Gibson go, and if they get hurt, then obviously you would think Rodriguez is the the next man up. So 
Um, he could see playing time if those guys get hurt, but I, I would think those guys will see the majority of the touches. Um, I, I think Rodriguez was in, in a kind of similar vein of Brian Robinson in that he's a kind of between the tackles, doesn't have a great burst or um, uh, he doesn't have that home run speed, but he can really pound it between the tackles. He's really physical. He embraces uh, like taking on bigger guys and, and trying to shed tackles and breaking arm tackles. And um, he definitely initiates contact with, with defensive backs and tries to run them over. And, and he does so quite regularly. So um, he's a fun back to watch in that regard. Um, he, he's not quite as shifty as Brian Robinson. Robinson, what we didn't really fully see from him last year because of his injury or because of his, well, because he got shot yeah. um, <laughs> is, is we didn't see that burst that he had in college. In college, he has, he had an amazing jump cut that he could make a really sharp lateral jump cut and he could do it one uh, sort of back to back um and, and that's not something that rodriguez has rodriguez is more of a uh one cut and go kind of guy um he's not going to make anyone miss with a really shifty move but he he will he, he's kind of like alfred morris in a in a way where he will you. you'll give him the ball on an outside zone he'll make that one cut that'll be the right read and then he will lower his shoulder and, and run over whoever he can um, and pick up a good amount of yards doing so. So um, I, I think in terms of a role for him, I think he's going to be that kind of third running back. Um, he'll spell Robinson for maybe five or 10 carries a game. Um, <clears throat> that, that might be generous, um, but um, maybe maybe there's a situation where you say he's a better zone runner than Brian Robinson. And, and this team that we're playing against this week is, is a, team that's particularly weak against his own runs so we'll use him a little bit more there um and, and maybe he could be kind of a pass protection specialist because he, he does have some nice pass protection ability so um if, if you're playing a team like maybe the cowboys that like to to move people around and, and try to disguise some blitzes um and, and force the running back to stay in to protect maybe on, on that week you're looking at more rodriguez in the backfield to protect rather than gibson trying to run routes um but I, I think it will still be the majority of the work. We'll go to Robinson Gibson. Right, right. Um, so the new, what I've been like, kind of, I guess, like seeing here and there, like the new theme in the NFL is throw to score, run the ball to win the game, as in like throw to put points on the board, and then eventually incorporate your run game to kind of close the game out and bleed the clock out, whatever. Um, so my question is, and you can see kind of the Chiefs kind of come from that style with Eric Bieniemy, Andy Reid. My question is, do you think to this point Washington has done enough to kind of go with that philosophy this year? Or do you think that – I'm not going to say the two-to-one thing like Martin Mayhew said <laughs> afterwards, but do you think they're going to be more of a run-heavy, uh, dominant team like last year? Or do you think they're going to try to go with the new age style of offense, which, like I said, is throw first to – throw to win and – or throw to score, run to win? Yeah, I, I think they'll probably be leaning more towards that kind of modern style of – you, you throw the ball to get your points on the board. And then once you've got the lead, you you run to run the clock out. Um, I think it will be leaning more towards that, but I still think it will be relatively close to a 50, 50 split. Um, and a lot of that will be down to a lot of what they're probably going to do with, with how will be um, RPOs and like quick screens and stuff. So it's going to be the passing game's not going to be like, they're not going to drop back and do seven step drop backs 10, 15 times a game and be like Tom Brady sitting in the pocket or Peyton Manning sitting in the pocket for four or five seconds. It's going to be, you know, get the ball out really quickly and get it into the hands of the playmakers. Um, and, and that you can lean on as a passing game and and you can build into that via the the run game with RPOs and, and Sam Howell's running ability as well. Um, so I, I think the split will be pretty close to 50-50. Um, but I think they will lean more towards, you know, we're going to pass the ball more early on to try to get ourselves into a, a favorable position and then run the clock out with with the run, run game. Yes, sir. And now, Mark, it, as of late with the team, the rookies have now come to Ashburn. It's been reported that Quan Martin is dealing with a family emergency, so he has been given a pass for this weekend. He will, he will be back week two. That's been reported by J.P. Finley. My question for you, in your opinion, who is Mark for the fans? Because obviously we put a lot of weight into your opinion, Mark. Who are some undrafted free agents, some some guys that are showing up to rookie minicamp that maybe you want to keep an eye out for? 
Well, I haven't done a, a huge amount on the undrafted and free agents, if I'm honest. Um, the, the the guy that stood out was the the short the, the short returner, Kaz- Casimir Allen. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and, and he seemed like he had some return skills. And obviously, Washington have kind of struggled with return guys. Bar maybe DeAndre Carter um, right. had a, had a good year as a return guy, but other than him, they they've kind of struggled. Um, so if you can find someone that um you know is explosive and and can give you something as in the return game um and maybe catches on as kind of a he seems to be kind of a hybrid running back wide receiver kind of guy so maybe he catches on as the kind of sixth receiver slash fourth running back or something like that um and, and then he can be the kind of return guy and fill in a couple of different roles um uh, that seems to be the kind of guy that i think would make the team um maybe they they found one of the offensive linemen they 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 gave a, a pretty big signing bonus to um maybe that's someone that they they think could develop and, and stash on the practice squad um but uh, i find I, I i didn't see any guys in this class that i made, that kind of jumped out as like that guy is definitely going to compete for a roster mm-hmm. spot um so it, it it was hard to say there is anyone at this point that that will make the make the team yeah, definitely. Um, there's a guy on each side of the ball that's, uh, I would say, kind of critical to the success on both sides of the ball. Chase Young is coming back from the injury, and Logan Thomas as well is coming back from the injury. Which do, which two do you think has a bigger impact on the team this season, Chase Young or Logan Thomas? Well, I would hope Chase Young, um, g- given he – just in general, he is the better talent. Um, and and yeah. if, if Chase Young plays to his talent level um, – and he he starts getting back to the the guy that was the second overall pick, um, then he's having a huge impact on the defense and and the team in general. Um, whereas Logan Thomas, if, even if he plays to his best form back, what was it, 2020 when he was he was at his best? Yeah. Um, even if he plays to that, he's still probably the second or third option at best in this offense. You, you're still going to Terry McLaurin over him. You're probably going to. Jahan Dotson and Curtis Samuel over him. Um, obviously, there's there's situations where you want to go to a tight end um, and, and in the red zone, and he he can be important in that regard. But in in terms of just your general between the twenties, um, you're kind of looking at the, the three receivers before Logan Thomas. So um, I I think if they're both healthy and back to their best, Chase Young is the guy that that you would hope would have the bigger impacts, but. Um, and I, I, I kind of, I kind of back Chase Young to have a, a decent year this year, um, and and hopefully he will. Hopefully he'll he'll bounce back. Um, it, we saw a little bit towards the end of the year of, of him having, kind of, at first he was a little bit tentative with how he was rushing, and, and he was starting to get into it, and then he kind of tailed off at the end in the, in the last game. But um, I, I think there were signs there that there's still a lot of talent in Chase Young, and and hopefully we get to see that this year. Absolutely, totally agree. Now to wrap this up, Mark, I only have a couple more questions for you. What is your, a lot of the fan base are going to want to know, Mark, your opinion on the offensive line. What is your projection for the starting five for week one? So I would say the starting five would be, well, Leno's locked in at left tackle. Um, I I think Andrew Wiley seems to be locked in at right tackle. Um, and Sam Cosme, probably right guard. Um, I think Gates will probably get the start at center. Um, Stromberg, I think, can push him. Um, but I, I think there's a few things for Stromberg to work on, and I don't think they necessarily would have signed Gates with and brought back Larson if they were intending to have Gates be the backup. So um, I, I think... Probably Gates gets the gets the nod over Larson and I'm uh, sorry over Stromberg and then left guards they seem to be willing to go with Chris Paul or Steve Charles and and the way that they've constantly mentioned Chris Paul throughout the last year um, I I tend to think that he probably has the edge uh, especially as Charles kind of struggles to stay healthy um, so I would guess it would be Leno Paul Gates Cosme and Wiley would be my guess. A lot of people would be happy with that, and I'm glad that the team did invest in adding some help up front. Next one for you. Can you do a projection for the DBs? I know it's kind of hard to do based on the different defenses. So, Mark, let's just say the base front is a 5-1-5. Um, what do you think the five 
projected starting corner uh, DBs would be for week one? Yeah, so I think um, with, with Quan Martin drafted, he gives them the flexibility to basically stay in their their Buffalo nickel or their big nickel package where they have a safety in the slot. And, and Martin essentially is a, a slot corner. Um, so when they play teams that are using three receivers, Martin will be down over the slot. And if, if the team then substitutes a receiver for a second tight end, then Martin probably rotates back deep and Cam Curl probably comes up and covers the tight end. So um, you're probably looking at Martin in the slot, Cam Curl at strong safety, um, probably Derek Forrest at free safety. I think Percy Butler could push him, but we'll see. I, I think Forrest probably has the, the leg up at the end of last year. Um, and then I think Fuller starts outside on, on one side and Forbes starts outside on the other. And then that leaves St. Just as kind of the, the primary backup, I suppose. Oh, wow. That would, that'd be surprising. I'm not going to lie, but um, look, you put the best guys out there and if that's where the uh, things fall, that's where they fall. Last one I have for you. What is, what's more likely to happen? And I don't want you just to say your answer just to appease us or anybody watching. I want to get your legit opinion here, Mark. Okay. What is more likely to happen for Washington to lose 10 games or win 10 games? Uh, I, I would just say more likely to happen is probably lose 10 games. Um, I, I, I would say it's tough because the overall roster, I, I quite like most of the talent on the roster, but I think we've seen enough from this team to know that the, the defense can be hit or miss. Um, it, certainly in the Ron Rivera era, the, 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 and with Jack Del Rio as the defensive coordinator, they, they've been on very hit and miss, and, and they came on strong towards the end of last year. But let's not forget, the start of the year, they were horrifically bad. So, um, you know, I, I think there is a, a tendency for them to go missing at times on defense, and the offense will go as far as Sam Howell will take them. And, and as much as I think Sam Howell has got some talent, and, and there's a, a system that they can build around there um, and can be productive. Um, if you're going for what's most likely most quarterbacks end up failing <laughs> when they come yeah, into the NFL. True. So the the most likely outcome would be that he, he struggles and, and they, they lose 10 games. Um, I know that I'm looking for a certain answer here and I don't mean to be a stickler, but what do you, what do you think has to happen for Washington to win 10 games? So I, I think the defense needs to either continue to be, you know, solid in the in the red zone and very good on third downs or they need to flip to being that heavy turnover kind of defense where they can give up points but they also create a lot of turnovers and and give the offense more opportunities um and then on offense it as i say it it goes as far as sam Howell takes them so if if they're to win 10 games sam Howell needs to kind of show up and and be like hey i'm i'm the guy i can i can develop um and i think there is a path for that. Um, I think for me, the guy that I was comparing Sam Howell with when everyone else was comparing with other people was Jalen Hurts. Um, <laughs> because that that Philly system, that they're, they're a very similar body type. They're both a little bit shorter, they're both a little bit thicker. Um a Hertz plus is a, a plus. Hertz is, Hertz is a little bit um faster, but um Sam Howell isn't slow and, and they can they can kind of implement what Philly did where they 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 have the run games. They have the. They can use Howell's running ability in with the read option. They can build off of that with RPOs and play action. Um, the enemy should be able to improve the screen game, um, and then that really limits the amount of pure drop back passing that Sam Howell has to do. Um, and if you're working the kind of quick game stuff um, more often than not, then then it's kind of one read, two read, get the ball out um, and. and and you rely on the playmakers. You rely on Terry McLaurin. You rely on Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel. You get them the ball, let them do the work. So I think there is a path for, for Sam Howe. And, and we saw it with what the Eagles did with Jalen Hurts. So it's not impossible. It's not inc inconceivable that he could, you know, develop nicely and, and win them 10 games. Um, I, I, if you're just asking me to bet one way or the other, I'd say, obviously, it's more more likely that he doesn't than he does. But I, I, I hope that he does. And I, I think there is a chance that he can. Yeah, absolutely. I, Mark, I really do appreciate it. And just to let everyone know, he's not saying that Sam Howell is going to be Jalen Hurts. He's just saying play <laughs> style and what they're able to do with him offensively. So don't yeah. go attack Mark from 
please don't. <laughs> Mark, I can't thank you enough, brother. I know it's late where you are, and I really do appreciate you staying up and being able to educate us simpletons uh, with your opinion on football, brother. Um, mm-hmm. Just before we get out of here, if you'd just like to plug your social media handle, just in case there's anybody watching that hasn't followed you yet and would like you. Yeah, uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at Mark Bullock NFL, um, and you can find all of my stuff there. And Substack as well, right? Yeah, I've got a Substack page, uh, which is markbullock.substack.com, uh, and I do kind of breakdowns of um, of all the commanders, like draft picks is what I'm doing at the moment, and, and then I'll be looking at scheme stuff in the offseason. Yeah, fantastic film breakdown, guys. So if you want to go Definitely. get educated Definitely. on commanders players, go follow Mark Bullock on Twitter. Mark, I can't thank you enough, brother. Go and enjoy your weekend, sir. Get some good night of rest. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See ya. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. I always appreciate being able to talk to Mark um, because – you know, he doesn't have the same exact opinion on of as me on a lot of things, but I like I want to hear his opinion because I know there's validation behind it, you know? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Like you said, some of the best breakdowns on his sub stack, the way he breaks down schemes, the way he breaks down co- uh, passing concepts and route combinations and whatnot, definitely A plus work. So, like you said, definitely uh, go check it out if you already haven't. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to let you guys know, Mike Reed had an emergency with his son. Uh, so he should be joining us here momentarily soon. I wasn't lying to you, but uh, he, had, he, got, he got peed on, dude. That absolutely sucks. You got R. Kelly. Now, I wanted to ask you this question, Hall, um, because it seems that there has been slow leaks coming out in regards to Washington's schedule throughout the day. And as of right now, Kenyo Hansen has submitted the leaks as of yet. Um, week one right now is supposed to be the Arizona Cardinals at home. Week three, the Buffalo Bills at home. Week four, going to Philly to face the Eagles. Then coming back for Thursday night football against the Bears in week five. Week seven, we're at home against the Giants. Week eight, at home against the Eagles. Then week 11, at the Giants, followed by week 12, at the Cowboys. Week 16, at the Jets. Week 18, the Cowboys, which is great to hear. And obviously, week 12, we know that that is the Thanksgiving game, which has been obviously reported on today. Everyone has kind of talked about it a little bit. I don't want to get your opinion on Washington playing on Thanksgiving. I want to get your opinion on what is the your most favorite play from Washington playing on Thanksgiving. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, favorite play. I probably should have gave you a heads up for this. Yeah, but I mean, I'm just off the top of my head. Obviously, you got the RG3 game in 2012. Oh, right. You got the Jordan Reed crazy game in 2015, I want to say that was, or 16, one of those years. You got the Antonio Gibson game. The AG game in 20. Uh, you know what? I'm going to have to go with AG in 2020 because – I had him in fancy that year. That was when we drafted him. I was like the one that was jumping for joy. Like, yo, this dude is going to come in and ball out. He's going to be a baller, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously he came out his rookie year, scored 11 total touchdowns, had just under 1,000 yards. Um, I want to say total, just under 1,000 yards. He had like 890 yards, something like that. And, and he was yeah, utilized he was, as a passing down back. Which exactly. He was running between – yeah, he was running between the tackles a lot, just, just – eating up yards in the run game. Like you say, he wasn't really utilizing the passing game a lot, which everyone thought he would be. And that's why everyone had like that such great hope going into year two that like we haven't even really unlocked his pass catching stuff yet. So like he's about to go crazy. So, and just a part of this is also because I'm just hoping that he gets back to that where we actually use him in the passing game. Like you think back to the Buffalo game in 2021 when he took that screen to the house, even though the game was almost like out of hand at that point, but Still, he has a game-changing game feel or feel, field flipping ability for this offense, big play ability. I'm just hoping that he finally unlocks it this year, gets back to those 2020 things when he was busting out three touchdowns against the Cowboys. So, I would have to say the three touchdown performance for AG that that year in 2020 against the Cowboys. To be fair, I did ask you for your favorite play. I know, I, I couldn't I think know. of like a play off I know, the top I got of my you. Head. Um, but my favorite play, it takes you back to 2012 and it's the Santana Moss toe tapper at the in the end zone it was just like just one of those like perfect plays where just like everything works out for you on thanksgiving i'll never forget that game because we like we took turkey bowl very seriously and so we would go against other outbacks because our outback would go against like a frederick outback and i remember uh that day i i had a concussion i like i had a heel slap me in the side of the head and i passed out on my couch i woke came to and it was like i saw the score and i was like whoa what the mm-hmm. hell happened? And then that play happened with Santana Moss, and I was just blown. I was blown away. I'll never you know what? I'll be more specific. 
out of the three touchdowns you scored, I'll say that the my deuces. favorite one was when he put the deuces up, when he just broke it for like 30, 40, 50 yards, whatever the hell it was, put the deuces up, pretty much put the game out of reach. It was pretty much locked up. Y'all Cowboys getting stomped today. It was a wrap. Absolutely, it was a wrap. Now, my next question for you, Hall, that I would love for us to be able to talk about here, um, the schedule. Everyone has talked about it being the eighth-ranked most difficult schedule in the NFL. want to kind of get your opinion on that. Are you wavering at all in your predictions? Because we've obviously talked about our predictions up until this point. But what, does the right. schedule change it at all for you? No, because you already knew the opponents. Like, I mean, obviously the, the way the schedule plays out and travel and whatnot, back-to-backs, division games, like I said, that definitely plays into it a little bit. So – uh, I might it might waver like slightly, but it'll probably still be around the same prediction. But yeah, for the most part, I don't really get into the strength of schedule because if one thing one thing taught us last year when we had the one of the easiest schedules in the NFL going into the year, and we still only came with eight wins, came away with eight wins. And if you check the strength of schedule halfway through the year or three fourths of the year, <laughs> it was almost at the top because of everyone's because of the division obviously being so good. And yeah, so. Those things don't really, I don't really take into account. I more look at, like, the opponents that we're playing as opposed to, like, the strength of the schedule. And the NFL is so year-to-year, year, honestly. Like, there's so many first-to-worst and worst-to-first every year that there's so much turnover in the divisions for the most part that you can't even really go based off, like, oh, well, their record was 10-6 and six last year, so they're going to be a tough team this year. So, end of the day, I just look at the opponents and I look at the quarterbacks we're facing, and I kind of just kind of uh, make my – judgments and predictions off that yeah first and foremost this is the nfl okay every game is going to be difficult exactly. i know what exactly. the nfl is saying based on winning percentages and everything like that but I, I would be willing to bet that the big reason why they're ranked eighth is just because of the divisional opponents you saw how the cowboys new york and the eagles all made the playoffs. And you play the afc east so right. I mean, that's a tough division too right and so it's the division by itself but the division we beat the two of the best in the division and we beat yeah. them in a in a pretty good fashion as well. And so I don't think that that's just an easy throwaway for us to say. I think you should have expected it to be a hard schedule, but it doesn't waver at all. And um, I, I really don't waver at all. I would rather have a really good opponent week one, but ultimately I really don't care just to get you chined up and ready for the season. Um, but the hard schedule I'm not really concerned about because like you said, Hall, like you could look at the New York Jets game on the Christmas Eve and say that's going to be – one of the toughest matchups of the season. That's a very talented football team. And I'd say you're right. But who's to say that Aaron doesn't get nicked up the game before that? Or Garrett Wilson yep. is out, right? And so that changes everything immensely for everybody else. Yep. So there's no reason to really harp on that kind of stuff. But let's move on to our fan questions, brother, to wrap up this episode. Maybe we'll be joined by Reed at some point. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe he got pooped on by this point. But if he did, I'm going to buy James a beer when he's 21. You got he Dave Chappelle. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this next question is from Twitter. Our boy Scott Hartley in the UK. Oh, appreciate Oi. you, Scott. Which game are you looking forward to the most this season? Is it the home, op ho home opener first post Snyder? Is it Thanksgiving at the Cowboys, Xmas Eve versus the Jets, or something else? For me, it's the it's home opener, the anticipation, the expectation, and getting to hang out with you guys again is going to be fire. See, you partially took my answer. I would say week one just because I feel like this will be the first time in a long time that I feel like FedEx would probably most likely be bumping. I mean, fingers crossed that the sale was like gone through by week one, but more than likely, I think it will be, or at least partially gone through. But I think that, and Kevin Sheehan made a good point that he thinks that they're going to put the Cardinals on us week one, because I mean, outside of like Arizona, is there really like Cardinals fans like in the DC, Virginia, Maryland area? I would probably say no. So it'd be a great chance for, Post Snyder, people get to pack the house out week one. You have a team that's probably not going to travel as well, so it would be more Commanders fans. You know, like the optics of everything look makes the NFL look a little bit better. I told but, you if you if you want attendance for week one, just just make it the Marijuana Awareness Day. Okay? Yeah. That's all you have to do. That's I true. guarantee you. Yeah, it'll be packed up. It'll I'm be definitely kidding. packed up. Now, nah, but I mean, yeah, seriously, I think that. Um, I would say the home opener, obviously, because I think it's going to be bumping. It's going to be a lot of people. The vibes and energy is going to be great. And the UK boys and just the whole Twitter community, the commanders community on Twitter, more than likely is going to be there. They're going to be showing out. 
And a close second is – I'm going to say the Denver game. I'm trying to go to the Denver game this year. So I'm going to say I'm looking forward to the Denver game just because I'm going to try to take my two younger brothers who one of them is a, Red, or a Washington fan. The other is a Broncos fan. So. And they're twins. It doesn't make and any they're, sense. And they're twins. So uh, it would be a good time to chill out in Denver. Go to the game out there. So those are the two I'm looking forward to the most. Yeah, Wait, they're twins. Yeah, these yeah. twins. Have, these twins haven't been more confused since uh, Reed first time he saw his titties. What's up, dude? <laughs> well, what, do, what's up? Do you remember that Bud Light commercial? And twins. <laughs> and twins. <laughs> uh, I, uh, we had love a... you too. Here's the football. That was sick. That was cool. They should yeah, bring that was, back. That was that was nice. They should bring that back. Um, my yeah. next. Uh, we had a question from Scott Hartley. Uh, which game are you looking forward to the most next season, Reed? The one that he might actually go to. Yeah, week one. If I get to meet the UK boys, what's you, better than that? Is you that actually have home? to go. I, remember. <laughs> I will. Wait, the first home game. I say, you know what? Screw it. And I then his care. phone goes dead, and then you can't then, get Yeah, yeah. Then my phone goes dead, <laughs> so I start calling him, and I'm like, guys, I'm in a Turkish prison again. Get peed on what again. What am I going to do? Yeah. Dude, I don't want to talk about it. We had to go return a, a Penske truck and go in there and, uh, I'm, so like it took a while because like we were having to deal with them and then I'm go, coming to bring James in <clears throat> and uh, all of a sudden old mom's just like is that what I think it is on your shirt and I was like carrying James and I was like yep yep that's what it is yeah, that's exactly what it is I had to run in there <laughs> get a change there real fast it was miserable that sucks man I, I feel for you man I do now let's he's, move he's on. peed on me since he was like three months old <laughs> let's move on <laughs> to our next question from Twitter this is from Deuce Red Zone and Lab and the 54th if you guys haven't yet, go check out the 54th on Twitter. It is a great community of Commanders fans. <laughs> Being the 54th player on the roster, that's what we all are. There are no limitations or statues or anything like that. You're allowed to come on in and join the community, the 54th. We're a part of it. We'd love for you guys to all join us and be a part of the community. It's a great thing. But this question from Deuce Reed. Will you guys do the thriller if we win our opener live on the Burgundy Zone? <laughs> Look, the one thing I'll say about doing Thriller, first of all, yes, because it's a great dance. Um, I think it could be <laughs> more done around Halloween, but also, like, Michael Jackson can do no wrong. The guy was a homosexual pedophile, still cool in my book, still make great music. So, yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, but, I, but I will do it. I will do, the thr I will do the Thriller live on the Burgundy Zone if they do win a playoff game. True. Not that Is it not that important to you? Huh? Why not, like, like after the first win? I Man, I need to see a playoff win. You, you got to do a thriller first. Oh, gosh, never mind. He already got a victory. Ah, so we could, or Cowboys maybe suck. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you could howl at the moon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Red Wolf style. Did you like that? Yeah. yeah I didn't like good. it, but I said it. That was really good. Now, this next question, I'm going to go to you, Hall, first. And this is from our boy, Mr. Anthony Armstrong, the former wide receiver of the Washington uh, yeah. Redskins. And I saw this on Twitter, so I already got a little head start on it. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. You get one game to go to this season from the opponents, home or away. What game are you going to? One game, home or away. I've already said the two that I'm probably going to, but if I had to, like – pick one i would definitely say i want to see the great la stadium where we play the ram i don't know where we could be but go out to la i mean who doesn't like la warm weather nice weather palm trees yeah i know i knew you were gonna raise your hand but yeah i would say the uh i want to go out to la see the, the new stadium they got out there everyone says it's like such like a great time nice amenities and all that good stuff and yeah just go to the west coast until on the west coast for a weekend yeah, uh, for me, um, I would love to be able to go into Philly. You know, I, I, I already get yelled at on Twitter as much as it already is. I would love to be able to just go into Philly with my Washington gear and get yelled at the entire time. Which is like another day on Twitter, dude. I would absolutely love it. Um, Real life Twitter. But honestly, yeah. dude, I would absolutely love to be able to go see Atlanta um, or something like that or L.A. Um, just to go see him. my boy Tim lives out in LA. I haven't seen him in a couple years. I want to go uh, visit him again. I went and visited him in LA um, like 10 or so years ago. And what I was did you do when you were out there? Dude, it was the most awkward thing ever happened to me out there. Like some dude was handing out CDs, you know, me being an East Coaster, he's like offering it. I'm like, oh, cool. So I like pick it out of his hand and then he's chasing behind me and Tim's like, Kyle, Kyle. 
I was like, what? He's like, you got paid for that. I was like, why are you handing it to me then, dude? <laughs> you started yelling at him about how you don't support Prop 8. And I was like, Kyle, come on, be an ally, dude. Be an ally. <laughs> um, it, yeah, no, but the thing about LA is there's so much there's so much smug in the air from George Clooney's Oscar acceptance speech. Remember that? Remember that South Park? Where you admitted all that smug? <laughs> You're so stupid, dude. All right, now yeah, let's let's move on to our next question. Uh, we are going to go, and I can't find it right now. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. I'm looking. No, that's cool. Oh, my God. Of course. This always happens. Always happens. Uh, this next one is from, this is so awkward and boring. I am so sorry, everybody. This yes. next one is from, oh, my God. That's because we don't have any more on Twitter. I'm so stupid, dude. You had to switch apps. Yeah, let's go to the Colonel <laughs> with his first question for us. Can we can we assume, despite our brutal schedule, this will be an exciting year? With EB he, he, heading our offense and Riverboat Ron throwing all caution to the wind to save his job, what do you guys envision for 2023, Reed? Oh, I think it's going to be super exciting. I mean, look, the Commanders' defense finished third last year in the NFL. It, you you have a nice young quarterback that uh, a lot of people are high, are high on. There's these coaches, I don't think, would have baked their entire futures and the possibility of their job, with their jobs being on the line on Sam Howell if they didn't think that this guy could end up being something solid, and special, better than what we had last year. Last year, so you combine those and then the rookie draft picks, which should improve the defense. I mean, with the, this offense should be exciting. This should be a very exciting year. Yeah, and if you think about it, the last three years we finished middle of the pack. So, hey, it's it's only up, you know. Or it could I guess technically it could be down, but you know. <laughs> yeah, um, it's really funny, Colonel, because I had somebody um DM me on Twitter and send me two different cut up videos of Eric Bieniemy's offense at Kansas City attacking cover uh, cover three using the RPO play action offense with the play fake of the run and then throwing it. Um, and it, I saw a lot of it against cover three. They like to use that on the outside when they read that cover three, getting the, the linebackers to jump it with the play fake and then immediately throwing the ball to the outside. Sam Howell has that arm strength to be able to do that. But one of my one of the reasons why I love this is because it's that's one of the things Scott Turner wouldn't do. He wouldn't call screens when he sees a cover three going up because there's a lot of cushion over there. Like, if you're playing man-on-man, -man, he's going to call a screen over that left side, and he's going to force you to come up and make that tackle. And this is like what we have been missing in Washington, where it's like calling plays with purpose, with meaning, trying to screw with the defense. And that's what I, I saw just from the small sample size from the Kansas City. And obviously, we could talk about it being Andy Reid's offense all we want. The fact is, that mindset has been adopted after five years of working with Andy Reid. So adding that in with a third-ranked defense like Reid said last year, adding it in with the offensive skill sets that we already have on the outside, and Sam Howell's arm strength, quick ability to get the ball out in space, and his run ability, that RPO is going to be vital. And not even including Brian Robinson and Tony Gibson, their usage out of the backfield. Yeah, Colonel, I'm excited. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm excited just because... It's more of the quarterback is like the unknown. So you're excited to see like, oh, is he going to be good? Is he going to show more of what he showed us last year in week 18? So, but I just think overall, it's going to be a mixed bag. There's going to be some excitement because yeah. like, I think the off going to screw up. Like, it's yeah, going exactly. To happen, That's my point. There's going to be games where I think more times than not, there's going to be games where the offense is explosive or scoring points. And that's something we haven't done a lot of around here for the past couple of years. So that's just going to be exciting just by itself. And I think that, the vision was they were bottom of the league in offense last year. So you could bring in a guy that's been at the top of the league as offense. Obviously, he has Pat Mahomes on his team. But like you said, that vision from, from Kansas City is going to hopefully be adopted here. And you're a bottom of the league on defense as far as turnovers go. What do you do? You get the best cornerback in – you get yeah. the, the best cornerback as far as turnovers go in the draft. So they're trying to add pieces to make this team more exciting on offense, more exciting on defense, and make more exciting plays. And hopefully that comes to fruition. And 2000, like I said, it'll be ups, it'll be downs, but hopefully more ups than downs. You know, I, I really liked what Mark Bullock said. And because, you know, I've asked the question, what do they got to do to get to 10 wins? Right. And I said I was looking for something in particular. And I really liked his answer and saying creating the turnovers because, like we saw in that Dallas game, it made everything a lot easier for Sam. And that's what we want to do. But in my opinion, going forward, if we're going to be able to get to 10 wins, I think we have to be able to average four and a half yards per carry. 
forcing the defense to con be concerned about the run game, allowing it to be easy on Sam Hell, like with those RPOs, forcing the linebackers up so it makes it easier to hit those slants and outs. You don't have to worry about those bodies being in the middle of the field. That could be crucial for this offense. It would make it easier for the defense, uh, being able to control the clock and everything like that. So for me, it's four and a half yards per carry, baby. Now let's move on to our Discord chat server for our next question. This is from Yamzy. Thank you, Yam. Appreciate you, brother. I have seen people across other social media social media channels saying that they don't think Sam was the confidence pick to truly be named starter for the season. People are saying that Jacoby was brought in because he is more of a traditional pocket passer and can't run a presumed RPO offense that EB might be establishing. Is it just me or are these people blowing smoke and grasping at straws just because they don't like Sam or wanted us to go after a more high profile quarterback in the offseason? Or is there any validity to this concern, Reed? I think any time that you bring in a veteran quarterback that's started in the league and, and played all right, I think no matter what, anytime you bring him in, fans are always going to be like, oh, look, there's a chance he could start, especially when he's going up against a young guy. And technically, I mean, if Jacoby Prosek is in there and tears it up, he could win the job. But I, I think a lot of it's just people so used to being disappointed and people so used to things not going the way that they should go that they're they're just expecting the, the Wiley vet to go in there and win and – they get hurt by week four, and then there was a big circus. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to happen with Sam Howell, okay? I think the guy's fine. I think he's a nice guy. Uh, the way he talks is super cool. He's a white hood guy, and I love that about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think that you're blowing smoke. Um, I think that Jacoby was brought in here because Washington kind of saw that we can't depend on the quarterback one. Like, you have to go in thinking your quarterback one is going down. And who is a quarterback around the league that has been proven to carry the weight of a team in case of emergency? And, and that's Jacoby Brissett. And that's why I think they went out and got Jacoby Brissett, because he is solid. He, he has a lot of experience. He's a big, tall, durable dude. You don't really have to concern about that all that much. Um, but he is dependable, and that's why they went out and got him, because he has the arm strength to be able to make those plays. He's not going to blow you off the this field at all, but he's going to orchestrate the offense the way it's supposed to, and I feel like they are very confident. And Jacoby, that's why they brought him in. I don't think it's because they don't think Sam can run the RPO. I, I think Sam can run uh, the RPO with ease, because I've seen him. Like We saw it in training camp last season. Right. I was like, dude, he might be 5'10, but he throws the ball like he's 6'5. He throws the ball better than Carson Wentz does on a rope. And that's why I kind of was looking at Matt Miller's comments with a weird look at it. Like, what is great arm strength then? My goodness. Right. You know what I mean? Was, what about you, Hall? It was. Go ahead. Oh, no. It was just Matt Miller's. I'm just going to say, Matt Miller's fucking dumb. It's stupid. <laughs> it's just so stupid to even say. That's literally Sam Howell's thing. Watch him play football. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Yeah, strong no, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think Sam Howell can definitely run the RPO offense and um, kind of like they the West Coast, uh, like Andy Reid runs a West Coast offense. The West Coast offense with some RPO stuff. Uh, I feel like Andy Reid is the kind of, kind of guy, like obviously he has West Coast stuff, and he, he still molds the offense to what his players, his skill positions, his, his line, his quarterback can do best. So if you're sticking with just – you're assuming the philosophy of Eric Bieniemy is going to shift from Kansas City to Washington for the most part, then I think he's going to mold the offense around what Sam Howell can do best, what the skill players do best. And that's definitely going to mix in some RPOs. And, yeah, I think that uh, – like you said, I think Jacoby Brissett was brought here. Just if you look around the league, at all the teams that used multiple quarterbacks last year due to injury, then you would see why they brought in a legit, like, pretty much like top tier solid backup. Now, it's funny you brought this up because and asked this question because I was listening to Grant and Danny and it was like Danny by himself going on one of his Danny Ruye rants again. Of course. And his yeah, his conspiracy is that the only reason that they went with Sam Howe and they're propping up Sam Howe and pretty much he's the guy is because they wanted to make everyone forget that they brought in Carson Wentz last year. And they didn't want the whole offseason to be about how dumb it was for Carson Wentz to bring him here and trade for him and blah, 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 blah. And he was saying that he thinks he thinks Joe, Jacoby Brissett is going to start more games than Sam Howell because if you look at the last two years, they wanted to – especially last year. Yeah, the last years. They wanted to run a certain specific offense, pass heavy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't working. Shift philosophies, hitting the ball off all the time. Game manager kind of offense and quarterback. And that's literally the perfect 
Jacoby Brissett. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think that uh, his his whole premise is they're going to start off slowly. They usually do. They're going to be one and four, zero oh and five, one and six, whatever it might be. They're going to shift philosophies, shift quarterbacks, and Jacoby Brissett will win the rest of the season out, play, blah, blah, blah. Me being logical, like I said, if you just look around the league and look at how many teams started multiple quarterbacks last year due to injury, you would definitely be smart to get a top-tier quarterback or a starting top-tier backup quarterback, low-key back-end starting quarterback on your roster. Fantastic. Sorry for the crazy rant. No, you're good. Now, this next question is from (laughs) Andy Lockhart in the Discord chat server. Oi, thank you, Andy. Oi. His question is, will Reed actually show up for the first home game of the season to meet the UK boys? Shots fired. Uh, yeah, shots fired like the Revolutionary War. Hall, you stopped with his response. Please re- oh, say it again. Oh, I said shots fired like the Revolutionary War where we beat the shit out of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just walking around wearing red coats and shit. Like, that's not a dead giveaway of where you're at. You know? No wonder you guys lost. Yeah. But no, yeah, yeah. If the, if the UK boys are there, mate, I'm going to go up there. And I'm probably gonna. I'm a super Australian. Yeah. Did it sound Australian? I always do that. Good yeah, night. I, always do that. I guess it is always the same thing. I don't know. Oh, I do have a little it's bit of yeah. in me from Love on the Spectrum, so I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Dude, I watched that video and it, I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was Isn't actually it, a thing. He's so funny. <laughs> Dude, all right, now this next. I part- will find love, and what I want is like what I want is I want. On my wife's deathbed, I want people to walk up to her and say, your husband loved you more than anybody in the world. And it's like, why are you planning for your death, dude? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? This, oh, this next question is from Orange Crush 92 I don't know if this was talked about, but do you think we skipped on Christian Gonzalez because of his 10-yard split? Uh, um, I don't think it was his 10-yard split. I mean, it might have been like a – factor in it possibly i don't know i think it was more of just going off of uh what john Kahn like reported and put out there is the tape like forbes played in the sec was around like a top competition all year as opposed to christian gonzalez who when he played a team for the sec like georgia the the tape was not really what you wanted to see as far as like he was getting bullied on the field they, they like bullied on the field he wasn't really as active in the run game as they would have liked as opposed to Forbes, who he'll come up, make a tackle despite his size or his weight, whatever you want to say. So I think it was just a bunch of things, and it's pretty much – I mean, it could have come back to bite you in the butt. Yeah, possibly, because Gonzalez went to the Patriots, and if he has like a crazy rookie year, wins defensive player of the year, something like that, people are obviously going to jump back and be like, it was the wrong pick. But on the flip side, if Forbes comes in, does what people think he's going to do, which is turn the ball over – and be a solid corner, then the pickle looks straight. So, end of the day, could it flip? Could it be egg in your face? Yes, but I think that uh, I think Forbes is going to come in and be a solid corner. Yeah, I, I do think it probably has something to do with that. I mean, it comes off on film when you watch Christian Gonzalez. You know, you don't see that speed, that um, agility, that jump, that power that right away when he comes off his running. And so I can understand why, because you would be concerned at the next level if he could be able to track some of these other guys. One of the arguments I've continuously heard about Forbes is his weight, right? Well, my opinion for an outside corner, your weight does not matter to me. Um, Your weight is not going to help you going against Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, Jahan Dotson, Terry McLaurin. What's going to help you is your speed, being able to play and knowing route concepts and going against really good competition in the SEC. I think Emmanuel Forbes kind of proved that there. Um, And that's why I feel like, the 10 yard split probably did have something to do with it just because you want to be able to match that speed of the NFL level in an elite way. And if Emmanuel Forbes c- crosses that list more so than Christian, that would make sense to me. Yeah. And plus uh, Chris Collinsworth even brought up a good point. He was like, I've never been playing against a cornerback. and being like, Oh man, this guy weighs a lot. Like it doesn't, <laughs> you just don't think about it. And also I think if I'm going to be honest, I think the reason that we passed on Christian Gonzalez is because uh, Ronald Trump was like, Oregon sending their worst. Nobody good's coming out of there. They're sending their, you know, the, the bad hombres. So I think that's what we're talking about. <laughs> bad hombres. <laughs> this next, thank you, Orange Crushes. Next did question. You get it? I said Ronald Trump. Yeah, I know I did. Like Ronald uh, Trump. This one's from Tim Towner in the Discord chat. 
Kime interviewed Ron Rivera at the annual league meetings. The last thing Ron Rivera speaks to is the, in the event he is replaced, he didn't want to leave the cupboard bare. That he'd look at the quarterback and that we would have five weapons on O, three wide receivers, one running back, and one tight end. Who do you think is the tight end he is referring to? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, if he's talking about this year, oh, I guess going forward too. Huh, that's a good question. Um, I, th- I think he's talking about, I'll say Armani Rogers. I want to say Cole Turner, but I'll say Armani Rogers just because I think that him just being like such a great athlete, being a, like a former quarterback. And like I said, last year he was like running like jet sweeps, running reverses. Uh, he was making catches in the, uh, in the passing game as well and really developing. Then he got injured. So I think they liked what they saw in him, and maybe he can keep developing, and maybe he's the uh, tight end they were talking about, or he was talking about. Yeah, it's Cole Turner. Um, Cole Turner offers you every facet. that He offers you the height of Logan Thomas, the jump ball ability, the catching ability. He offers you the blocking. Almost not as good as John Bates. Obviously, John Bates is an elite-level blocker. But Cole Turner is serviceable in a blocking, sort of like a Logan Thomas in that sort of sense. Uh, so I, if, if anything, I think it's Cole Turner moving forward. In the small sample size, I've seen him in college. And then how he grew as a blocker last season, it kind of screams the all-around tight end. And that's somebody you want to thrust into the limelight, especially with this offense with a young quarterback in the red zone. It, that's u- crazy good usage. And they're going to use that with Cole Turner. That's just my opinion. Yeah, the only thing I, I mean, it's stuff that I would imagine it's Cole Turner. I think that Cole Turner probably has more upside, especially as a receiver. But they did use Armani Rogers uh, in a lot of different ways last year, so I could see it being either one. He's still growing a lot, but um, I'm, you know, uh, Armani Rogers. Then again, Scott Turner was the one who used him, so maybe maybe they're looking at it and they're like, that guy's retarded or something. You know? so, no, I'm sure they're not saying that about him. <laughs> they, no, nobody <laughs> said that. nobody should say that. I don't appreciate that word for you said to say that, Kyle. I'm sorry. <laughs> Now, this next question from Tim Reed. Um, think our three-day rookie mini camp starts on Friday. Which player will stand out? What will the press say about the coaches, especially EB? I didn't hear. I didn't hear a word you said. Uh, I was talking. Go Hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, stand out. Uh, I'll say. I'll say Forbes just because I think that uh, his length that he brings as a cornerback is going to stand out as far as like him being at the line of scrimmage, jamming guys. Maybe he makes a couple of interceptions or like plays or something like that. And, and uh, I don't even know if they're like can go like scrimmage or whatnot. But yeah, I would just say Forbes just because he's a first round pick and they're always going to like highlight the first round pick and what he's been doing out there. Um, as far as like the coaches. I think you'll see a lot of videos of EB, like, getting after guys, being energetic, just, like, bringing that energy to practice, kind of like Randy Jordan did last year, the very loud vocal guy on the field that's getting guys hyped up and whatnot. And, yeah. Yeah, Just like Reed when he's at the club with all of his guy friends. Exactly. But, yeah, I think it'll be a lot of clips of EB just uh, getting after the guys, maybe uh, hyping up Jahan, talking to Sam, stuff like that. Let's hit the showers. (laughs) I love that movie, man. Uncle Ray Ray. Yeah, Uncle, Uncle Ray Ray turned out. <laughs> um, for me, Ooh, a balloon animal. Yeah. <laughs> for Uncle me, Ray Ray's got a game for you. Yeah, <laughs> for me, the pl- yeah Brandon. Yeah, Brandon. I said I, Brenda, I mean, Brenda. 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 <laughs> no, I, oh, no, real fast. The, the part where he comes down, <laughs> he comes downstairs in scary movie too, and uh, he's wearing a dress. Like after the guy's like seducing Cindy, and he's like, "I think he's starting to suspect something." And they're like, "Who?" And he's like, "Yo, why?" And it turns into Ray, and then he goes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just woke up and I came down here, and I don't know what's going on. What about you, Ray? And he's like, "Oh, I got mine on Friday. I picked this shit up. <laughs> shit is hot, right?" <laughs> <laughs> of course you love that one. Uh, but for me, the player I think is going to stand out is Ricky Stromberg. Uh, just based off what he's seen on film, a very sophisticated blocker, very powerful blocker. And it wasn't like they had invested a lot in uh, high-value picks on the defensive line up front in front of Ricky. And so if you're going to see anybody really dominating that kind of stuff, I think Emmanuel Forbes obviously is a great one. Quan Martin is not going to be there. Uh, so I think Ricky is really going to stand out up front and showcasing his ability. Yeah, same. 
Good job, dude. That was perfect. <laughs> uh, last question from Tim Towner. Do we still need a veteran linebacker? Has anyone heard anything about, let alone, uh, seen Drew White? Or do we need one more? He, let's get one more, like Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. Uh, I, so I don't think that the team is as high on linebacker as all the fans are. Everybody's looking at that like this. It's, it's so important. They've proven last year that like they really only needed two. Uh, they rarely used three. I think that they feel comfortable with their depth. They like the two young guys that they have right now. Um, bringing in Cody Barton, I think, was huge. I think he's the right type of linebacker. So I don't think so. I think that's why you saw them draft Quan Martin, somebody like that, so that way we can do three safety sets and still feel good about it. I don't. And dude, there, there's times that they could use four safeties as well when Percy Butler's on the field. So I, I really don't think, I think fans are putting way too much value on linebacker. It's a new NFL, man. It, this isn't, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it. Is it crazy to believe that Ron Rivera and company are okay with low investment in linebacker because they both played there and they know the position very well and they know they can get more out of it. And we could say that they haven't gotten more out of it up until this point. They were third-ranked defense last season. All right, let's calm down a little bit. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but I don't think they need to add another body. I think that Milo Eifert, um, other guys like are going to be able to step in and help out this football team. They kind of showcased it last season, and Reed kind of elaborated on it already. The linebackers are not as used as prevalent as they were 20 to 30 years ago. So you're going to be having more DBs. That's why more high-value picks on DBs because they're asked to do more linebacker stuff. Stuff And somebody like Quan Martin perfectly fits that bill for you. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't think that we need to add anybody else. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I mean, because you guys pretty much hit everything. Like, Jack Dolorier likes to run those five-man fronts anyway. You're going to have John Ridgeway coming back. You're going to have uh, Mathis coming back as well. So you're going to have some guys that you can throw in the, in the interior – you can throw some like Chase on the outside, Montez on the outside, Jonathan Allen, Duran, and Mathis, or Jonathan Allen and Payne, or whatever the combination might be. So you don't really need that uh, that third linebacker on the field. Most defensive sets nowadays, obviously, like you can say their base defense is just a four three or a three four. But if you really look at the amount of times that teams are playing nickel or dime a lot, because offenses are going uh, twenty one personnel or five, four wide receiver sets, three, three wide receiver sets all the time, more times than not. So you're going to need a guy that can get sideline to sideline as a linebacker. And if you already have two of those guys on the field and you're going with three or four safeties on the field or five DBs on the field, there's not really room for that traditional middle of the field linebacker that everyone's been clamoring for. Because like you guys said, the linebacker position has not been devalued, but it's been – I don't even want to say phase out, but, you know, it's kind of just been like kind of like the running back. It's like not really like the thing anymore, you know? Yeah, it is. It's the running back of the defense. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. I want to hear from you guys. What is your favorite play from Washington playing on Thanksgiving, either versus Dallas or somebody else? Doesn't matter. Um, and also, what is your what are you what matchup are you most looking forward to next season? The schedule is going to be coming out any second now in about an hour and a half. So we want to hear about your guys' input. We want to hear from you all on all the new schedule info. I appreciate you all. Comment if you can. Subscribe. We'd love you for it. All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. I'm you know I'm that I'm I'm him. I guess that's what Deion Sanders would say, right? That's yeah, a cool thing to say. Him. Yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see him you on Monday. Have I'm a sorry. great, him. safe weekend. Rookie mini camp is here. Schedule release. It's almost here, baby. Washington football. Woo! What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with t-shirts, hoodies, and zip up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.